did a very good job of introducing me, so I'm just gonna start off right from the beginning. Can everybody see that? There we go. All right. Uh, Tredegar's history really begins in the early 19th century, uh, the early years of the Republic. Um, at the time, not too long after the end of the Revolution, most of America's industries were uh, related to shipping. There were no uh, domestic industries to speak of outside of that to a large degree because of something called British mercantilism. Uh, during the colonial period, it was the common practice of raw materials to be sourced in the colonies, sent back to the mother country, in this case, Great Britain, and then sent back to the uh, colonies as a finished product to be sold and distributed. Um, and this was something that was very, very uh, regulated by Britain. They weren't allowing uh, a whole lot of machinery to come out of Britain, a lot of the technological know-how as far as iron making to really get out of the country. So when America started as an independent nation, it really had to kind of hit the ground running as far as building up its own um, industrial base. Um, the earliest industries did spring up, like I said, around shipping, and the, and the economy was kind of buoyed by three stages of what's been called transportation fever across the early country. This was a building of, uh, at first, road turnpikes, third road turnpikes, uh, the Shenandoah Turnpike up near Winchester is probably the best example in this state. Uh, the building of canals, most notably the Erie Canal up in New York, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, the James River and Kanawha Canal, which ran behind Tredegar. And then later, the uh, railroad industry, which really started in the 1840s in America. And that was kind of the industry that really jump-started American metallurgic industries. By that point, if you're producing iron implements, it's going to be for farm tools, it's going to be for miscellaneous things, but the railroads required iron for really the rails, the locomotives, everything. So that's what really jump-started the American iron industry. Trotter's history begins with a man named Francis Dean Jr. He was born in Cartersville in the 1790s, just outside of uh, Farmville. And he went into business with his uh, father-in-law, Edward Cunningham, and his two brother-in-laws. They owned a cotton mill that was on the site down here, just at the base of the James River. And one thing that Dean noticed was that there weren't any large-scale ironworks in Virginia, and in, particularly in the uh, Richmond region. You had the kind of arsenals that were producing cannon and whatnot during the Revolution and during the War of 1812. But for a commercial economy, there really was no large-scale ironworks in the region. Um, they started to build one on Belle Isle, and that started doing pretty good business, but Dean thought that he could do a little bit better given the number of connections he had in the industry. Um, at the time, as I said, American domestic knowledge of metallurgic industries was really limited um, because of British mercantilism, so he had to go abroad to find workers. And this is just a uh, map of the area around 1829 when Dean was really starting to formulate his idea for an iron works over here. Um, I don't know if you can see the details too well, but you can see a couple of buildings there. You can see the canal uh, running behind us. Um, you can see a cotton mill and a uh, leather manufactory. Those were the things that were on the site up until the mid-1830s. As I said, Dean had to go abroad for his uh, knowledge base, and he chose an area called Tredegar, Wales, and that was in the Sir Howie Valley, just a little bit west of uh, Monmouthshire in England. And that is really the home base for Britain's Industrial Revolution. It's an area that's rich in iron ore, in coal deposits, um, uh, wood, limestone, used in a lot of uh, iron making. So that was really the epicenter of it. Uh, all the iron and, and later on steel that was fueling Britain's Industrial Revolution was really coming from this region for a good number of years. It was also the area where charcoal furnaces were first developed for iron making. They were far more fuel efficient than just chopping down wood and using that to fuel the blast furnaces. And in the 1780s, this region also produced the first puddlers. And this is the operation through which uh, wrought iron is produced. Basically, your relatively brittle cast iron is reheated, reheated, reheated through these reverberatory furnaces um, to burn off a lot of the excess carbon, and that produces your stronger wrought iron for more um, kind of for structural iron and things like that, for where you need something a little bit tougher than cast iron. And this is uh, like a little map down here of Wales, and this image is from the ironworks, the Sir Howie ironworks, from around 1780s. This was the central <laughs> The gentleman in particular that he sought for helping build his ironworks was a man named Reese Davies. He was born late, uh, late 1790s, 
uh, just a little bit outside of Tredegar, and he served it for a time in the British Army in the Royal Corps of Engineers before leaving the Corps and building uh, ironworks both in Great Britain and then following the Napoleonic Wars uh, for a number of wealthy landowners out in uh, France. He came to New York with his uh, family, his wife, his kids, his father, and a number of other his fellow workmen, and built a couple of uh, ironworks up there before being called down to Richmond at the behest of Francis Dean. Uh, he relo relocated to Richmond, and on this site he built the, uh, what at the time would have been called the Tregeager Rolling Mill, um, in honor of the area where he had first apprenticed. Um, in the ensuing years, it kind of became American Southernized to uh, what we call Tredegar today. But I've been told by a number of Welsh folks I've talked to that I'm pronouncing it wrong. So, <laughs> and I said, well, maybe you're pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> um, Dean had a lot of things going for him uh, by starting ironworks in this region. One was the Richmond Coal, coal Basin. This was the primary source of coal for the colonies and later the early republic. Uh, the Richmond Coal Basin is approximately 96,000 square acres of coal deposits that span a number of counties, uh, roughly from around here, all the way out to Powhatan and Wheels. So it's a very, very large deposit of coal. Um, this image is from, if you've been down to the Chesapeake Coal Mine Park that's out near, uh, out in Midlothian. Um, they have, they preserve some remnants of the site and a couple other later structures out there. Uh, one of the earliest railroads in the country was actually for transporting Chesterfield coal uh, down to the docks in Manchester. It was this 31-mile gravity rail where it was put at a gradient where it could just go unassisted down the rails, down to the docks, and then it was pulled back up to the mines uh, by use of a mule. So he had access to coal, which would have been important. He also had access to the James River and Kanawha Canal. Like I said, this was the remnants of it still run behind Tredegar today. Uh, initially surveyed by George Washington, uh, his goal was to build this canal to connect to the Ohio River. That's why the Kanawha is in there. It would initially connect to the Kanawha River, then to the Ohio River, which would make, in his hopes, uh, Richmond or Central Virginia the economic and commercial center of the country. Unfortunately, the project was hampered by a lot of sudden starts and stops, and the Erie Canal was built first, and that's why you have New York as the financial center of the country and uh, arguably the world. Um, if Washington's original idea had gone through, then we'd be in New York, technically. Um, this image here is just from a bond that was issued uh, for the construction of the canal uh, in the 1820s. Um, like I said, it had a number of starts and stops. By the 1840s, it had reached about 250 miles west of us out to Buchanan. And why that's important for Dean is because that allowed him access to the blast furnaces of Botetourt County. Uh, that area is rich in iron ore deposits, and there are a number of blast furnaces out there. Um, this image here is one that's been restored out in the uh, Thomas Jefferson National Forest in Botetourt. So Dean had a number of family members who owned blast furnaces out there, so they were able to... This is one thing I mentioned here. Dean's company, he had the Tredegar Rolling Mill built by Reese Davies. The Virginia Foundry Company was a small operation that he established beforehand. And in 1837, he incorporated those together into the Tredegar Ironworks. And why the iron coming from Botata was important, it made Tredegar the first, one of the first vertically integrated ironworks in America, meaning that Dean had control over the entire process from sourcing the iron out of the ground through its uh, making it into cast iron, being shipped down the canal to Richmond and being turned into a finished product. He had control over the entire process, which was for America pretty rare at the time. And the reason for that is a lasting effect of British mercantilism, where we were having, again, having to hit the ground running and starting our own early industries. Uh, Reese Davies became the first superintendent of the works, had about 50 employees here initially, largely a foreign workman from Wales who had arrived with him, his family members and his fellow workers. Davies was killed uh, a couple of years after the founding of Tredegar in kind of a weird situation. He was killed. He was helping uh, construct an ironworks over the river on Belle Isle. And he was killed by a fellow workman. The newspapers say something pretty vague, uh, something along the lines of he was in a moment of uh, passion. He was killed. He was he was dropped. He was dropped down or something like that. Basically, what it sounded like. Also, because the person who attacked him or who stabbed him was arrested, but he wasn't charged with anything. It seems like it may have been a workers' dispute. Could have been self-defense on the other guy's part. We really don't know. Um, some people have asked me, well, if you looked at his headstone, would it say, would that give any information? 
Um, unfortunately, we don't know where he's buried either because the newspapers say he was buried on a pretty spot on Belle Isle. So <laughs> that could be literally anywhere. So we don't know the circumstances behind his death, although we do know that his family stayed here, his fellow Welshmen stayed here, and um, a number of them were actually buried up in Hollywood Cemetery, um, came across their graves not too long ago. Um, in the early years, Judiger was facing pretty rough times on a number of levels. America then, as it is today, is subject to financial panics or recessions uh, every 10 or 15 years, and back then was no different. Uh, Treadiger kind of started up in a time where there was a lot of financial uncertainty. There were depressions over in Europe, which in fact, which affected investment over here. Um, one of the sources for uh, America's industries of capital was foreign investment. So if there are problems in Europe, there's going to be problems over here. Um, there was also a lot of uh, problems with the canal. At one point, they were they closed the canal so they could widen it and deepen it. And all the machinery that ran here was running on water power from the canal. So that had to shut down operations for a number of uh, number of weeks. And also too, there's a little bit of mismanagement. Uh, Dean was in the habit of reporting unsold product as basically potential profit. He was claiming profits that he did that hadn't actually been realized yet, um, which was legal and it's still legal. It's actually something that Enron did uh, 20 years ago. They were reporting profits that never happened, but they were reporting them as, oh, we made this much money. Um, if you're in a boom economy, that's not too bad because you're going to sell your product and you're guaranteed a sale. Um, in a downward economy, that's not very good. You end up with stockpile and stockpile, stockpile of unsold products. So Tredegar was hurting on a number of levels financially and they needed new blood. In 1841, they hired as purchasing agent, a man named Joseph Reed Anderson. He is a native of Botetourt County. He, um, served, he graduated from West Point and he focused on engineering there. He helped uh, survey the Shenandoah Turnpike up in, as I said, outside of Winchester. That's probably one of the things he's best known for uh, outside of Tredegar. Um, this image is a is a painting of him from around 18, mid-1840s when he would have started working at, at Tredegar. Um, as I said, he was initially hired as purchasing agent, but the board of directors saw that he had such a good business acumen, he decided, they decided to give him more and more responsibilities until effectively he was running the operation. Uh, he also benefited because uh, two of his brothers owned blast furnaces in Bogota, so he was able to even strengthen that connection with blast furnaces to get raw materials down Tredegar for operations. Another individual I'm going to mention here is a man named Anton, Anton Osterbein, uh, and his family is, it's kind of an interesting story. They're parallel with Tredegar's history. They were here from the very beginning, and they were here until almost the very end. Um, spanning about four generations and 200 years. A family of German immigrants, uh, they built their houses actually up the hill off on Belvedere, now the site of the Virginia War Memorial. They were torn down um, in the 1950s to build that. But his family will be popping up throughout Tredegar history. I wanted to mention, mention them. In 1843, Anderson leased the Tredegar from the stockholders, effectively making him president of the company. And a number of years later, he bought it outright from them. And one of the benefits he brought to Tredegar was due to his military contacts, he was able to get government contracts for weaponry, for cannons. And that really buoyed uh, Tredegar's economic outlook and really put them on the map and helped them uh, solidify it as a going concern. One thing he did also, too, was he had a small locomotive shop going, he had a rolling mill going, he had a uh, a rail shop going. He had all these like minor operations as part of Tredegar. And what he did um, was he separated those into their own businesses. He brought in a number of investors and basically ran them as separate operations with him always being the principal partner. And with this extra kind of influx of capital, he was able to grow them into their own organizations and make them profitable for the first time in their history in a lot of ways. And in 1859, he brought them back under one roof, under J.R. Anderson and Company. Like I said, he owned the works outright. He owned all the businesses. He was the sole uh, proprietor of the operation. Um, with this enlarged Tredegar, it became the largest ironworks in the South and the third largest in the nation. And the upper management was largely composed of Anderson's family. His nephew, uh, he had his uh, father-in-law. Uh, the father-in-law ran a something called the Armory Rolling Mill, which was just across where, kind of where the uh, Postar building is now. And that was the site of the Virginia Manufactory of Arms. And that was, depending on the year, it was the Richmond Arsenal, it was the Virginia Arsenal, it was the Confederate Arsenal, but it was largely supposed to be responsible for producing all of 
Virginia's uh, cannonry and rifles and everything. As far as cannonry goes, really, Tredegar kind of took that over. But Anderson's father-in-law ran the armory rolling mill. He rented out of space and ran a small operation there. That was incorporated into Tredegar. So on the eve of the Civil War, you have Tredegar largely expanded. You can kind of see over, over on your right. Uh, the Armory Ironworks ran by his uh, father-in-law. You see some of the operations, still, I, don't, like, I don't know if you can make it out too well, but there's a locomotive shop near the river's edge, um, the spike factory up uh, near the line of the canal. And like I said, this was the largest ironworks in the South at the on the eve of the Civil War. At Fort Sumter, Tredegar cannons were used in the attack on the fort. <coughs> When he started getting con a cannon contract, when he first came to Tredegar, it was originally for the federal government. But as tensions increased in the 1840s and 1850s, there were a couple instances where secession almost happened, but it didn't. But all through that time, the, the what would become the Confederate states were increasing their own armament supply. So he was increasingly uh, getting government contracts from the state governments as opposed to the federal governments. Uh, following the attack on Fort Sumter, Anderson led a procession of workers and, and other Confederate sympathizers uh, on a march down from Capitol Square down to here and hoisted a flag above the uh, above, above the rolling mill building, I believe. And so you know where his his uh, loyalties lie during that. Following Virginia's secession, Anderson uh, initially tried to sell Tredegar to the Confederate cause outright to the Confederate government, saying, "Take this over as the official uh, Confederate armory." They weren't interested in that. Maybe they didn't have enough money, or, or whatever may be the case. Um, but they wanted to remain a private industry under Anderson's direct control. And the fact that Richmond had the third largest ironworks in the state and the largest in the South was one of the reasons that the capital, Confederate capital was moved from Montgomery to Richmond. Um, Richmond was a hub of all sorts of in industries, not only iron alone, but that was one of the, one of the reasons was that it was the base for most of the uh, Confederate cannonry. By the end of the war, they had produced over half of the Confederate cannonry that the Confederacy used. So it was a main supplier of weapons to the um, Confederate states. Anderson did serve in the military, served as Brigadier General, but during the Seven Days Battle, he was injured and returned uh, to Tredegar to manage it. And one of the things that um, came about was, as, as some, of you, some of you may know, cannons are usually produced uh, using bronze. But as copper and tin supplies dwindled, as the Union was cutting off uh, supply routes and everything, they started to make cannons entirely out of cast iron. And they had some initial problems with that, but they were able to eventually uh, get the process going and and make a very good cannon using only iron. Um, another problem Anderson had was that his puddlers, who were vitally important for a lot of what they were doing, they struck a number of times, most, most importantly in 1863. And that was a situation where Anderson didn't really have a choice. He needed these guys in order to keep the Confederate war machine going. Uh, one of the cannons that they produced out of cast iron was the Brook rifle invented by John Mercer Brook. And this was developed really intentionally to be a cannon cast out of cast iron, understanding that there would be a need for the Confederacy to rely on cast iron. That's largely why it was developed. Um, and there are different, different bore sizes. Um, the seven inch bore rifle was capable of shooting 880 pound shell over 21,000 feet. And that was, and that one is, they were largely put on the, um, the iron class. I think this is from the CSS Texas, if I remember correctly. Another thing that Tredegar did here during the uh, Civil War was create the armor plating for the CSS Virginia, formerly the Merrimack. And this image here, I don't know if you can make it out too well, this is something I came across in the Tredegar archives of the Library of Virginia. In the 1930s, the owner of Tredegar was going back and talking to all the old veterans, trying to basically putting a, together a Tredegar history scrapbook. And one of the workers was explaining that how they made the iron plating for the CSS Virginia is that they had a basically made a box of wrought iron through uh, rail iron, in there, like railroad iron in there and heated it, melted, uh, pushed it down, heated it, rolled it down, rolled it down. They actually had to make uh, specialty rolls uh, to actually get this process done. Um, and that's how they made the iron for the plating for the CSS Virginia, this kind of basically an iron sandwich uh, to give it more strength and defensibility. 
And by the end of it, over uh, 723 tons of Tredegar iron was used in the plating for the CSS, uh, CSS Virginia. After the Civil War, uh, Tredegar was spared from the evacuation fires. This is allegedly due to the efforts of the Tredegar Battalion. This was a home guard that was created <clears throat> early in the war because there was a manpower shortage and the Confederate government kept conscripting every available man that they could. And it was become, starting to become a problem here at Tredegar because they were conscripting all the guys who were making all the candidry and everything. So there was a compromise reached between Anderson and the government saying, okay, we'll create a home guard. They'll be called out in defense of Richmond or for uh, local areas. So they can still serve in the military. We can still have them on the, on the military roles, but they can stay there and continue to produce uh, candidry for the cause. Um, and a good portion of Richmond was destroyed the evacuation fires. Uh, the Virginia manufacturing arms over there uh, exploded, but Traeger was saved again. Could be a legend, could be, don't really have a whole lot of facts, but it's, it's said that it's due largely because the Traeger Battalion was defending it from arsonists and looters and things like that. Um, after the war, Anderson and his family sought pardons from Andrew Johnson, and they got them, and they were able to start uh, Traeger back up and running. One reason for this was one of Anderson's nephews, Edward Anderson, was essentially a blockade runner during the Civil War, and he was running uh, Union blockades, uh, ships full of Southern cotton over to England to exchange for gold and to bring back for the Southern cause. One of these trips, and it, one of his diaries is up at the Library of Virginia, it's really interesting to read. Uh, one of his last, well, I guess his last trip back, um, the war was over by the time he got here, and he had all this gold that was destined for a government that no longer existed. So that went to the Anderson family. So that's one reason that's where, on some level, they were able to get the capital, only for not only for their personal wealth, but also to jumpstart uh, Tredegar after the destruction of the war. 1867, the company is reorganized and incorporated. And this is, this is a big deal for the company because before it was a private business, it was a family business. Anderson literally owned the property. He owned the company. In, in 1867, it became a company with shareholders and a board and everything like that. For all intents and purposes, the Andersons still owned it. They were the largest shareholders by far. So on paper, it was a stock company, but Andersons were still running the show. They weren't producing cannons anymore. That had kind of died out with the Civil War. But the railroad industry was still going, so they were producing cars, boxcars, trucks. Um, they are still making, not locomotive engines, they stopped that shortly before the Civil War, but they were making stationary engines for grain mills and grist mills and things. Railroad spikes, horseshoes, those were big business. And structural iron, a lot of the bridges that were being rebuilt across the river were using uh, Tredegar iron in their rebuilding. Um, 1866 to 1873 were boom years, not only for Tredegar, um, but also for the country. It was kind of a post-war economic boom that was going on, largely brought on by having to rebuild the South. So Tredegar was doing very good to the point where they were able to open a New York office in, uh, during that time. And here is another map from around 1869. And it shows, again, how much everything had expanded in the ensuing years. You have the puddling mill over here on your left-hand side. That's expanded, the rolling mill there. Rolling mill over to the far right, that's the remnants of the armory rolling mill. Armory rolling mill was still in operation, even though the uh, Virginia manufactory of arms was gone by that point. Excuse me. Could yeah. you just show us where we're sitting right now on that map? Not through the whole, you are here. Yeah. Um, right here, this building is encompasses the central boundary, the first boundary that was here. So you're you're in what was this building? Um, say like right around, right around here. So you up the hill, and then like I said, you can go up the hill. You can see the remnants of the uh, of the canals here. And think, yeah, you're right around there. Thank you. Uh, with all booms, they have to come to an end. In 1873, one of the worst economic <clears throat> depressions to hit the country happened. And this was largely a situation where you always hear about bridges being built to nowhere. Uh, in this case, that was actually a reality. The railroad industry was booming, and you had a lot of companies who just kept building, building, building railroads. 
and for a railroad to really make any money, they have to have <clears throat> commerce or, or traffic traveling on them, you know, going to a large city where there's an industry or, or settlement where people are going to be going. Um, but these railroad companies kept getting financing, financing to create more and more railroads. And they were going through areas that either had no towns or very little. There wasn't going to be any money made from traffic using these rails. So you had a situation where railroad companies were failing, the finance houses that were financing them failed, and it led to a kind of infected the rest of the economy. And as I said, it was one of the worst uh, economic disasters that hit the country in, in before or since. A good example of how something like this would affect Tredegar, the New York and Oswego Midland Railroad had ordered 250 rail cars from Tredegar um, shortly before collapsing. And at the time, a lot of these uh, orders, these large-scale orders, were done on credit. Of course, when a company collapses, you're not going to get your money, and you've already started production on these railroad cars. So this is how Tredegar is losing money. They're losing money from people you know, buying on, on credit things that they will never actually get money for. It was so bad that Tredegar ceased operations for several weeks. Uh, 1876, it was forced into receivership, meaning that uh, any money that came in was solely going to go to repaying their debt. There were going to be no dividends for stockholders. Um, any any prices, any uh, profits made were going to go to workers if need be, but there were no, not going to be any profits for shareholders or dividends or anything. It was solely to go to repaying their creditors. And one thing they learned was during that period, they operated on a cash-only basis because they had been burned by accepting credit uh, for so long. <clears throat> 1880, uh, Tredegar had emerged from receivership and was creating a profitability. Uh, puddling furnaces were shut down. That's the furnaces that made wrought iron. And the reason for that was this was about 15 years after the Bessemer process for making steel was, was uh, brought to America. And more and more things were being produced with steel. Because of that, there was a whole lot of scrap wrought iron being sold off very cheaply in order to like, a lot of railroads and a lot of other businesses were converting to steel. So the market was flush with wrought iron. So <clears throat> to save money, Tredegar was buying wrought iron from the scrap market business in order to melt it down and repurpose it and recycle it. Um, the James River Canal Canal closed for commercial traffic. Uh, the boats that were bringing either iron ore or anything else down, down the uh, canal, that all ceased. It did stay open because Tredegar had perpetual water rights. So all the machinery that was running on water power, they were still able to run that because they were able to use the water power from the canal, but it just shut down as a means of transportation or shipping of goods. Going back to this family that I mentioned of German immigrants, Osterbein, uh, Henry Carter Osterbein was the son of the patriarch Anton Osterbein. He was manager of Tredegar's rolling mill. And a lot of uh, Tredegar workers, Osterbein, but also a number of others, were uh, skilled machinists and inventors in their own right. There are a bunch of patents that, thankfully now, due to Google patents, you can go check them out and you can see what they're actually yes. inventing uh, for, for the railroad, for the general iron making business. Um, he produced a number of uh, machinery that improved upon the process for making horseshoes and railroad spikes. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in 1914 after getting injured on the job. Um, there was no workers' comp for families at the time, so his family didn't get much, but his son, Carter Clark, Clark Osterbein, did start here. He was a graduate of Virginia Tech. Um, worked briefly for the Richmond Locomotive Works, the uh, branch over in the Shaco Valley before coming to Tredegar and working in the uh, bar mill. He died of a heart attack in 1915, and I have a picture. Here's a picture of Carter Clark and his father uh, shortly before his death outside and I've always tried to find where this picture was actually taken. I know it's here, but the details are a little uh, unclear as to where it's actually taken. 1892, Joseph Reed Anderson, the uh, for all intents and purposes the proprietor of the works, passed away. He was succeeded by his son, Archer Anderson. Here's a picture of him here in his later years. Uh, he was a gifted polyglot, spoke a number of languages graduated from UVA. He served in the Confederate Army as well, just as his father had the title of General Anderson throughout the remainder of his life. Uh, Archer Anderson had the title of Colonel Anderson. That's how the son and father and son were differentiated between the two in, in elite society. 
And this is a picture of what Tredegar looked like in the 1890s, uh, circa 1890. And this is likely taken from a point over on uh, Brown's Island, kind of a perch on Brown's Island. You can see the, see the smokestack, the largest smokestack here. That's the uh, 1861 gun foundry that we have over there. And a lot of these buildings are long gone, obviously, now. Some of them remain. You can see the building we're in roughly kind of behind that giant smokestack. Um, but as I said, this is a sprawling complex. At its height, it was about 23 acres. They weren't making cannons uh, anymore. They were making railroad implements and everything. But with the onset of the Spanish-American War, they did get back into making shot and shell for the federal government. Uh, in 1914 to 1916, they made shot and shell for the U.S. Army and Navy, but they wouldn't take any uh, orders from European governments. A lot of companies were taking contract from Britain or France to reduce uh, shell and ship it overseas. But for some reason, Traeger decided not to do that. They would only work with the United States government. Um, and I have, there's a picture, I don't know if you can read the signature there, but it's a letter to Tredegar thanking them for their services uh, during the war by acting Secretary of the Navy, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's up at the uh, Tredegar Archives up at the library in Virginia. This is a picture of Tredegar management in 1908 circa. Uh, this picture was actually taken outside this brick building that we have right behind us here. That building <clears throat> dates back at least to the 18-teens. Um, it served as the offices for the leather bu business that was here before Tredegar, and it served as the administrative offices for the Tredegar company. And as far as I'm aware, it still is the offices for the museum today. Um, it's out, its picture was taken out back behind that building. And in some of this, I can point out some of these guys. Uh, here is Archer Anderson, the head of the works. Um, this is the fellow, uh, Captain Edward Anderson, the blockade runner I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, this is Henry Osterbein. And this fellow right here is a man named Frank Glasgow. And he's the father, he was Anderson's nephew, but he was also the father of, if you've heard of the Richmond novelist, Ellen Glasgow. That was, that was uh, her father. She, he worked here for the entirety of his life, actually. And she would write, some of the things she's written about were stories running around Tredegar when she was a little girl. This is Archer Anderson. He died in 1918 and was succeeded by his son, Archer Anderson Jr. there, uh, sitting, sitting in his office there. <clears throat> and it's kind of interesting, too, that building, at least last time I was in there, still has, in some parts, this wood paneling along the edges. I don't know if that's still there. That's still there? Okay, yeah. So it's kind of one of those stay true through the through the years. During the during World War One, uh, profits they were flush with government contracts. They were making shot and shell for the for the Navy and the Army. So their profits were going through the roof until really 1922. That was when before the war, Frank uh, Woodrow Wilson had put in an executive order to increase the size of the American Navy. And that continued unabated, unabated, until the Naval Conference of 1922, which was held between the United States, Britain, Japan, the largest naval powers of the time. And it was basically done to de-escalate an arms race of naval power that was going on. And it set a quota as to how many, how many battleships, how many dreadnoughts, how many, how much naval weaponry that a country could have. And when the quota was implemented, federal governments for Tredegar dropped uh, precipitously. You can see there. Um, they were starting to already go down, but by 22, they are basically non-existent. They would still get some small government contracts here and there, but nothing like it was before. Um, absolutely none during the years of the Great Depression. And really, it was the rearmament in the late 1930s that really returned Tredegar to some level of profitability. This image here on the left shows Tredegar's uh, management at the time. Archer Anderson Jr. had passed away. And the man on the far left, Paul Miller, he was uh, the president of the company at the time, and he was the first non-Anderson to run it. So that was a, that was a bit of a new thing for them. Uh, Tredegar, like I said, during World War II, during the rearmament and during the war, uh, they were awarded a number of Army and Navy projects to the point where they were 
given a number of awards for outstanding work in their production of ordnance. And this image here, it shows a bunch of the workmen uh, standing in front of this Navy Army E banner. This is the award they were given. And if you notice, they're all um, seasoned. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there's a twofold reason for that. One, this picture was taken to as a kind of celebration of people who had worked at the works for over 50 years. But there's also a reason why there were a good number of people who were working as, as for that long for the company. And the reason was, <clears throat> as early as the late 1920s, Tredegar's management, seeing all of the uh, strikes and issues that were going on in other industries, they made it kind of their policy to only hire older workers. They thought that they were more strike-proof, for lack of a better term. They were less likely to strike, um, to demand higher wages. Um, they weren't as in demand for as much work as possible. You know, if they were able to get by with what they were doing, that was fine. Um, they also said it was because these guys were, were more experienced. They do the work better than anybody younger. But by and large, it was a cost-cutting measure. They wanted to, and a, as again, a protection against any sort of strikes. They didn't have to worry about any uh, older folks going on strike as often as younger workers, say, at some of the um, factories in other states. Getting back to the Osterbein, so there's a good number of family members there keep going on working at Tredegar. William James Osterbein, he was uh, nephew to the patriarch Anton. He worked here for a number of years. <clears throat> this fellow in the picture here is James Reinhold Osterbein, and he worked, he started in the 1880s and retired in 1953. And it was a big enough deal that this picture is from the Richmond Times Dispatch or the Richmond News Leader at the time. Uh, celebrating when he actually retired in 1953. And, and his story was really interesting. He mentioned that one of his, his favorite thing to do was uh, on Saturdays, he would take his weekly shower. And uh, and if you've ever been to an ironworks or anything like that, uh, having a weekly shower, his, his wife was a brave, brave woman. Um, take his weekly shower and he would go over to Hall Street and catch a Western double matinee. And um, this is just a little interesting story about him. He was talking about his life growing up here and how all of his family worked here. Um, but yeah, the family, he was the last one to work here um, after his, his great uncle, I believe, uh, started working here in the 1840s. So it was a long family connection with the company. By the early 1950s, uh, Tredegar was obviously the writing was on the wall as far as its profitability. You can see in this chart, their profits going down 45 after the war. You can see how much it drops down. They were doing so bad that the, the depression years could be considered very good years composed to the post-war years. That's how bad it was going. And there was a number of reasons for that. Um, as I said, the Bessemer steel process really came to America in, right after the Civil War. And Tredegar never converted to steel. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, it's interesting to read the letters from the presidents. It seemed like any time they were thinking of converting the steel production, an economic panic happened. In 1873, during the boom years, they were like, oh, we're going to invest in some Bessemer converters, um, probably build some in the site here, or maybe rent out some space on Browns Island and have a Bessemer plant. Panic, 1873, wiped that out. Um, 1919, the president of the company at the time wrote a letter to shareholders saying, we're going we're gonna to get some investment. And we're going to build some, uh, at the time, the preferred method of making steel with, with uh, electric furnaces. And he said that we we're going to invest some money in putting electric furnaces on the site to produce steel. Then the post-war recession after World War I happened, and they just get, didn't get to it. So it was a combination of bad timing. Um, and also, too, I think by that point, the owners of the company were just fine with it, kind of pedaling along. They were even, even in years where they weren't making a whole lot of money. They were, the shareholders were still getting dividends. And if you're a member of the Anderson family where you have like 20,000 shares of the company, you're still making a good amount of money for not really doing a whole lot. So I think it was kind of a mix of not an interest in innovating and in the times where they were interested in it, it just happened to be really, really inopportune times. But whatever the reasons, um, they did not convert to steel. So they remained strictly iron in an industry that was largely, largely going to steel. Um, in one of their big businesses was making railroad wheels. In 1950, the federal government mandated that all railroad wheels had to be steel. 
So that shut down that industry. Um, there's an interesting letter because they were making small amounts of shot and shell for the army during the Korean War. <clears throat> and after the Korean War ended, they were still trying to get government contracts. And there's an interesting letter from the Secretary of the Army or whatever down to Tredegar saying, we can't use your stuff anymore. We, we're, all of our stuff is going to steal. Um, we're actually starting to put electronics in some of our weapons. You're just, you're using basically 1890s technology and we can't depend on it anymore. So as far as government contracts, as far as uh, commercial work, their industry was really drying up because they had not converted to steel production. Albemarle Paper Manufacturing Company, founded in 1887, their, um, Main, their initial plant was down here, uh, just below, down the hill from Hollywood Cemetery. And they had a number of plants, one there. They had a facility up, up top of the hill here, which is still there. That's their corporate headquarters now. And they had a building over on Browns Island. And the one thing that was in the way of connecting all these di different places together was Tredegar Ironworks. And Albemarle was interested in purchasing the site for... A little bit for production, but largely for uh, storage and for having easy conveyance between their multiple uh, paper mills. Negotiations began in 1950 or mid-1950s and were finalized in 1957. Um, Tredegar ceased to exist. A successor company, the Tredegar Timber Company, was created to manage not only the remnants of the ironworking side of things, but also the company owned large tracts of land which were continuously harvested for timber. <clears throat> Once the timber ran out, um, the company was renamed the Tredegar Company, and they relocated to uh, out to Chesterfield and ran a very, very much uh, smaller version of the Tredegar Ironworks. They would produce things that could still be produced with iron, railroad spikes, um, a couple other railroad implements. And later on, they started getting like small scale structural steel, like the steel used in temporary buildings or, or sheds and stuff like that. And that operated until 1986. And as far as the Anderson family goes, uh, when this merger happened, I was speaking with a descendant of the Andersons uh, a couple of years ago. And as I said, the Andersons were the primary stockholders in Treader. You had some individuals who had 20,000 shares, 11,000 shares. When Albemarle purchased Tredegar, Tredegar's profits that year was around $100,000. Albemarle's profits for that year were $23 million. And the deal was... Everybody who had Tredegar stock, their stock was converted into Albemarle stock. And what she was telling me was that literally you had a bunch of these family members become millionaires overnight. She was telling me like a bunch of them went out and bought like three cars in one day and stuff because that's, that's a pretty big financial windfall. And that might have been near the end of the line why they never sought to convert to steel was because they knew they were sitting on valuable land, which eventually some deal would come to put and, and offer them a great deal of money. But Tredegar shut down in 1957. A successor company operated until 1986 out in Chesterfield. And it was interesting. It was a number of years ago. I was working in uh, the building over here at the time. It was the headquarters for the National Park Service. And uh, I was researching stuff uh, for Tredegar. And a fellow comes in and he looks at my laptop and he says, hey, that's me. And I was what I was looking at was a, a union newsletter uh, from the union that looked that represented the workers at that Chesterfield site. And it was this individual pouring railroad spikes into a, uh, into a bin to get shipped out. And sure enough, it was him. He was, he was, and he sat there and talked a while about the Tredegar history. So that was, that was a really interesting <clears throat> kind of a uh, happenstance running into that guy and running into him when I did. After closure in 1957, the site was largely abandoned. Uh, initially, Albemarle was hoping to use it for storage and with within the confines of their paper milling business. However, they soon kind of took a different turn. In 1961, they purchased uh, the larger Ethel Corporation in Pennsylvania, renamed themselves that, and really went into that business um, for what they're largely known for today. Um, fuel additives, plastics, um, flame retardants, a, a chemical company. And they started gradually getting out of the paper milling business. They changed their name to Ethel. They have their corporate headquarters up there. Um, now they're known as the New Market Corporation. They changed that about maybe 15 years ago. <clears throat> In 1972, Hurricane Agnes came through Richmond, flooded a good portion of the city, uh, this area included, and a lot of the structures uh, came down. And the city of Richmond came to now the Ethel Corporation, which owned the site, and said, either tear down everything or save what can be saved. So in the early um, 
early to mid 1970s, Ethel began a restoration of the site. He brought in a number of stories to really dig down, research the site, both physically, but also the company records and provide a history of the site, which is invaluable to anybody researching it today. <clears throat> they were able to restore the few buildings that could be saved. In 1994, uh, the Valentine Museum, right now up in uh, right near City Hall, uh, they operated a short-lived venue here of Valentine Riverside, which was a history museum. It was kind of an attempt at an amusement park. Um, it didn't really take off uh, very well. It, it shuttered um, within about a year and a half. Um, and I think part of the problem with that was that it wasn't really talking about the history of the site, but so much the <clears throat> guy who was running the Valentine at the time was thinking about making, he was talking to consultant from Disney, he was going to have roller coasters, and they were predicting like 10 million people a year visiting. It was just a ridiculous uh, as expectation to have. But that lasted uh, about a year and a half. That shut down. Um, in 2000, the National Park Service made the Pattern Building right here next door to us the home for their visitor center for all the battlefield sites around Richmond. And in 2006, the American Civil War Center opened. Fast forward a couple of years, uh, the Civil War Center, which was based in that building over there, the old 1861 Gun Foundry, merged with the Museum of the Confederacy to form the American Civil War Museum. Um, the Pattern Building is now, that now belongs to, I think it's owned by CoStar, if I remember correctly. They use that for, it's not a historical, I mean, it's, it is a historical site, but it's not used as a museum anymore. Um, the Park Service relocated their operations next door to the 1861 Gun Foundry, and this building was constructed um, <clears throat> a couple years ago. And these walls here, if you were here any time before this building was constructed, these were just open air. This, these are the remnants of the central foundry. Its, its pedigree goes back to the original foundry that was here um, when Francis Dean started the inauguration. There's a little infographic over there, uh, signage talking about the, the history of the central foundry. Um, so I was happy to see that the original structure was able to be incorporated into this new building. And that gets us to modern day Tredegar, although this picture is a number of years old, obviously. Pattern building is missing its historic Tredegar across the way there. And <clears throat> this building doesn't exist and the parking lot looks quite smaller, but um, that gets us to today. There was a company here written called Tredegar that made plastics uh, fairly recently, I think. Yeah, that was a, that was the, um, I mentioned the Albemarle people be, became, uh, Ethel and became New Market. And they, they spun off their plastics division as the Tredegar Corporation. And it's a spinoff of that company. It's still in existence. They're still making stuff. They're not based down. They do have headquarters in Richmond. I'm not sure where they are exactly. I want to say they're closer out to like actually Midlothian. Um, but you're right. It is related to this site in the sense that it's a spinoff of the company that bought Tredegar. I understand that uh, Tredegar made the armor plates for the Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any other families around that, that helped? Uh, not around here at least. Um, some were built in, in other states in the Confederacy. Um, Tredegar was really the only one within this region that was capable, that had the machinery. Um, and then, like I said, they had to create specifically larger uh, rolling mills to be able to roll that iron, to roll that box of wrought iron filled with rails, smaller, 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 to make that iron sandwich. Um, but no, Tredegar was the only one around here. Now there are other smaller iron works that were, that were adding um, you know, they're producing like nuts and bolts and, and for the general war effort, percussion caps and, and general things. But as far as the ironclad, as far as the plating goes, um, around here, Tredegar was the only one actually producing that because they were the only ones with the capability to do so. And also, how were the uh, iron plates uh, transported to uh, where they were being built? To, you know. I mean, down, down to like, the, like uh, Norfolk and stuff? Right. Was it down on the James? Um, I believe so because a lot there was some of the real some of the railroads were still in operation. Like I guess you could call it like the internal, you know, a lot of the railroads outside of Richmond and everything were being torn up and, and destroyed and, and warfare and everything. Um for a time, for a little bit the railroads were able to carry that down. Um but also as the rail network deteriorated, yeah, there was um shipment down the river down to get the, to get the iron plating down there. That there was a kind of an unusual conflict here over the uh, use of enslaved workers. Mm -hmm. And it was you know, some kind of a conflict between the white workers and management over the over 
the use of enslaved people. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, was in, what was that about? In 18, uh, there are a couple of instances, but most well known is 1847. There was a strike on the part of, it was largely, like I said, the, the workforce was still, the white workforce was largely still composed of a lot of the immigrants that had come with Reese Davies and a number of, that had come since then, just because um, their knowledge base was just so valued. They were predominantly here and they were striking because Anderson was basically taking um, the enslaved workers and having them be apprentices to these workmen and, and largely in the puddling furnaces. And this was a group of people who were still very concerned with the guild system. They wanted to choose their apprentices. They wanted to you know, be the master to the apprentice. It was also a, a job security thing. They, they understood that if, if the enslaved workers were to learn um, these skills as well as they had it, then they would be out of a job. So I think it was it was a certainly their kind of entrenchment in this kind of guild mentality, but also just job preservation. Um, they they struck against that, and uh, Anderson let them all go, uh, and he and he kept working a little bit with the with the white workers that remained and all the enslaved workers. Um, production actually went down a little bit after that, so. A number of the workers actually came back. He hired them back. Some, uh, some of them were, were new to the site, but some of them were the actual guys who had struck initially. They came back um, just because the the work uh, the work had dropped down um, as far as quantity and quality. But that's what happened in 1847: was that uh, enslaved workers were being pushed to be um, apprenticed to these puddlers, largely of, of European descent, who, who again. Partly because they wanted to choose their own apprentices, they took some pride in that as as their craft. Um, but also because they understood that if they could, they were in danger of losing their jobs to these workers if, if they were able to learn all of their skills. In the nineteen thirties, when they were hiring older workers, uh, who were less likely to strike. Mm -hmm. Was that partly due to the communist and socialist movements and striking at the time, thinking that older workers may not politically lean that way? Or? On some level, I think it was largely due just because um, as evidence during the Civil War, during World War I, during World War II, um, a lot of industries had strikes just during war because it was, it was a situation where it was a workers market. Workers knew that all these industries were, were getting government contracts, they were hiring like crazy. You know, a worker at Tredegar could go somewhere else and make a good amount of money elsewhere. I mean, if he was younger and he wanted to go. Um, and that was the that was the case at many other sites. The Richmond Locomotive Works, for instance, they were producing shot and shell for the uh, Allied powers, and they had a number of strikes. And it, it was because, like I said, it was a workers' market. They could go. The companies really had to work hard to um, keep their workers. So, and, and also, as you said, it was there were a lot of um, you know you had the, kind of the twenties, the Red Scares, and everything of, of the, yeah in the fifties, but also in the twenties to a large degree. Um, not so much that during the wartime it was more so just because workers could really go wherever they wanted. Um, so Tredegar said, okay, well, we don't want to keep paying these guys more wages if they're, if they've been here for 50 years and we give them an incremental raise every so often and they're not going to strike and they know what they're doing, then we're fine. And they weren't, they weren't at, because they didn't convert to steel and weren't converting to newer methods, they really, they didn't really need a whole lot of newer workers. They were still making largely the same stuff for all intents and purposes that they had shortly after the Civil War. So it was that knowledge base um, of stuff that was already being, that had been making for a while, combined with the fact that these guys weren't gonna strike because they, they had less of an inclination to it.